Welcome to Two Month Review. Um, this is the first, or I guess this is the second episode, technically, of the second season. A season in which we're going to be reading Thomas Janssen's bestseller by Goodberger Bergson over a two-month period. Reading it bit by bit, appreciating it, enjoying it, trying to explain some of its eccentric... Um, eccentricities and it's some of its uh, background and give it some context to this book. I'm Chad Post, and this season, Linton Smith, who's on the line with me. So, hey, I, welcome, see, everyone. I, I fucked this up with you, too. I fuck it up with Brian. I fuck it up with you. This is the thing that I'm <laughs> always going to do. So Linton, who translated the book, is going to be... you just constantly interrupting me, man. I just, well, I wait, because I don't know what the beats are for when someone's going to say hello or if they're not going to say hello or to break up my voice, whatever it might be. So anyways, um, Linton's <laughs> going to be joining me for this whole season. He translated the book. You heard him last week explain and give some context to where Bergson came from, where this book came from, all that kind of backstory. And joining us this week as a guest is Anastasia Nicholas, um, who is a PhD candidate here at the University of Rochester. Um, And actually, say hi first. Hi, everybody. Really excited to be here with Chad and Linton. And Anastasia is someone that I know because she comes to our weekly podcast. what we call PLUV, our weekly translation workshop, where we go through different books that people are translating and read them out loud. And I have to say, I'll put you on the spot and embarrass you, is that your reading of things is usually like the best of anyone that's there in terms of like taking the the words and understanding like what's going on on a deeper level within the poem, within the short story, within the phrasing, whatever it might be, and being able to use that to like extrapolate and talk about the book as a whole, which I think would come in very, very handy in talking about Thomas Johnson. <laughs> I hope. Chad, I'm touched. That is the kindest thing. <laughs> I'm, I might record that for myself and just play it over and over again. For <laughs> it's, it's on public record now. You yes! Can your ringtone. Yes! You can your ringtone. Um, but before we, before we get into the book or any part of that, um, do you want to say anything about like what you're working on in your PhD or what your focus is? Yeah, sure. So uh, I guess what we, uh, in the field, we would call me a modernist or a post Postmodernist. I work on 20th century poetry and poetics. My dissertation is about um, late 20th century American poetry and the ideas of confession. So that's where my close reading skills come from because I was trained in a pretty classic department and um, I'm continuing my training here at Rochester in a very uh, classic new critical field, which means we look at the language at the level of the word. We uh, often pretend that the author is just kind of given us this little unit of language out of a, a meteor or an asteroid and like, who really cares who wrote this thing? So we'll just pay attention to the words on the page and see what we can get out of them. All right, which makes sense. And confession, anything with confession, this feels very confessional. This feels pretty confessional. Yeah. I mean, once you, once you start seeing things about like masturbation in the first like three pages of a book, you kind of know you're right on target. <laughs> you kind of know that it's an open letter book. Right. Point, like, well, three pages in and there's jerking off. It must have been a book that Chad signed on. There's, we even have penis on the cover for yeah. Christ's sake. Like, just all in on this. A passport to his penis. A passport to his penis. Um, <laughs> which we'll, we'll get to that part in future weeks. Um, I don't know. Do you have anything that you want to do? You want to frame this with Linton, or do you want to start dive in into this 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 section? I mean, let's dive in, although I, I do think we're starting a nice campaign to get this book banned, which would therefore increase its sales. So let's, let's, uh, I don't know. I think I, in a way, though, like that there is a there is a tension in trying to talk about this book. I'm going to I'm going to back it up for a second before I get in. Um, the there is a tension in talking about and trying to market and describe this book in which you're playing up both. It's it's sort of the fact that it's difficult, that it's challenging, that it's like a real high work a work of high modernist writing, that is something that had never been seen before, that it has all that to it. And that's what sort of makes a book really entertaining and interesting to me. But that also has like a very cerebral focus. And most book readers are just like, oh, no, like, I don't want Icelandic Ulysses. What I want is like Icelandic Nicholas Sparks. Like Nicholas Sparks is someone I can understand, <laughs> I can relate to. Or, or to go back to last season's podcast, George R. R. Martin. Like if it's like, is it Game of Thrones in Iceland? Then I'm in. Mm-hmm. Like, but like Ulysses in Iceland, I don't like regularly. I don't like Ulysses in Ireland, I'm much less like Ulysses somewhere else. So, and this book does have that, like the masturbation, the jokes, the 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 all the stuff with related to that. That does take it out of just being a cerebral. How do you figure this out? How do you think about it? What do you do when there's a page with no per- no periods? And there are these parts that are very loosened and very, like, meaty and funny and, and that you could just read those on their own. I don't really have a comment there, except yeah. that it's hard. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. 
point, and I think, I mean, partly I'm now tempted to try and make an argument for Nicholas Sparks as a postmodernist, <laughs> but, but, you know, stepping aside from that one, um, I think there's this sort of sense that, like, difficult books are somehow, or postmodern books are somehow not for all readers. And and there's a real risk to, to that narrative, because, it, you know, essentially you, you've got a book here which is about this sort of, like, decrepit, senile guy who's observing the world around him and and as you say he sort of takes it down to, to the sort of the really base level like the things he's observing around him like he's, he's describing in the first few pages what his apartment looks like so that you can see it he's talking about these strange inventions that he's come up with to try and avoid getting like water up his nose in the shower he's <laughs> listening to his lodgers coming back and having sex in the hallway right and like you know we can i mean we may not be able to completely identify with that i mean i don't know how many of us are sitting in the shower being like how do i stop getting water up my nose but there's, <laughs> you you know, there's nothing inaccessible about this and, and so and i'm kind of curious what Anastasia thinks as somebody who's, you know, sort of studying the, 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 the postmodern uh, about that sense of like, it doesn't have to be esoteric to be postmodern. Absolutely. Um, that's actually a difficulty or di like the idea of being difficult is a big idea that's like kind of bandied about when you're talking about modernist literature. Um, so the turn to the postmodern is often, uh, that's kind of what I study when I'm studying confession, is this moment of trying to reclaim the idea of talking about something that in like a plain, plain spoken that feels um, taboo and is interesting because of that taboo rather than being interested in something that's difficult um, and the way that it's constructed in a diff like difficult in like with with its difficulty in mind. Um, so a book like this, I think, is really interesting. And I actually I think it's really funny that we keep talking about it in terms of Ulysses. This actually makes me think more of Virginia Woolf, um, because we do have this like kind of first person perspective. And we have a lot of this kind of stream of consciousness, like up in the brain space of the writer uh, of the uh, speaker of the book. Um, so it, there's something about it that like feels like we're kind of trying to like parse the psychology, um, which feels a little bit more postmodern in a certain way, but um, with bearing in mind that we're really paying attention to the way that the language is constructed um, to create that experience, which feels more modernist to me. So it's like a really interesting kind of study in that um, space between the modern and the postmodern. And there's penises. Um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, I completely agree with that. The book that I think, it, that I think the Ulysses comparison comes in part because of both like one on the wordplay, sure, but two on the sense that it's a book that people own that they don't read. Right. <laughs> and that, that's the easiest, that's the easiest handle for like, what do you, what does everyone know, but no one's finished. Um, totally. And this sort of fits that bill. I always thought that it reminds me of The Tunnel by William Gass in the way mm. that he's like constructing and sort of unreliable and describing all these people around him and their horribleness and his like anger at the world, but in a way that's super unreliable and just jarred and like all over the place at once. But but before, okay, so we usually with these in the past, in the, in the past season, we tried to like try it with uh, Rodrigo Frezan's book. We'd sort of summarize what the section was that we were talking about, um, which was pretty easy. <laughs> usually it was like, it was like easy enough. We'd be like, this is a crazy thing, but here's sort of the beats and here's like what you have. This week, what we're talking about are the first 31 pages of Thomas Janssen, which are, consists of the biography, the first, second, and third composition books, each of which are sort of written and labeled differently and are varying lengths um so yeah so okay so i try to write a post about this like i do for each one of them um trying to kind of walk into the book a little bit and give like a anyone who's just approaching it for the first time some sort of general vibe and with this one the thing that i sort of came down to is that this book is these first three parts are sort of setting up where we are and who we are and what's happening so we have thomas Janssen who is at the present moment in time in which these notebooks, these composition books that exist, are being written, seems to be an aging, blind, going blind, or if not completely blind, um, man who's living in his apartment in which he's had to, been forced by law to rent out various rooms um, to other people. In the, in the World War II period, he rented out to, is it Sven and Katrine? Um, mm -hmm. As the first couple, and they had children and a cat. Then they left. He had this apartment to himself for a short period of time, and now Anna and Magnus, and Anna is a distant relative of his, are now living there, um, and his, that is his current situation. So in his mind, he's going back through these composition books and mingling both of those time periods. And one of the things that, the reason I mentioned that was that it was sort of a good marker for me in reading it the first time, of that when he's talking about the one couple 
we're in 1945-ish. And when he's talking about the other couple, it can be anywhere from like 50 something onwards, but you get, but at least like, you know, that the stuff like where he's working in the job or whatever that comes later, like sort of where that gets placed in his timeline, because the, the time on this is all over the place. Yeah, I as a I I read this uh, just to prepare for this podcast, and I got to tell you that timeline was bonkers for me. I had no idea who was where. Um, I can't imagine translating this. What translating this must have been like, Linton, because I I couldn't. I for a while I thought they were all living there at the same time. It took me a minute to like start tracking who was where and when, because um, it kind of feels like one of the weird things about being in his consciousness is like time seems like a suggestion to him. Um, <laughs> like it's not, time is optional, right? Yeah. <laughs> like I don't know. Maybe it right. happens chronologically, but I, that seems like way less important for him. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that's something that, like, looking, yeah, rereading I, this. I, I, oh, God. Yeah. No, go on, go on, Keep going. I was going to say, rereading this, one of the things I wanted to sort of pay attention to more than I did when I read it to proof it was, like, what triggers his next thoughts? Like, how is he stringing this together? Because sometimes it sort of feels, like, somewhat logical, and then frequently he'll just drift into something else. Like, things are going and going and going, and they're fine, and then it's just like, woof, and it fades apart into, like, this weird senility, and then it goes back to something else with it after, like, a little line break, um, and it sort of resets. But, like, how those things are linked is something that I thought would be really interesting to look at this time. Totally. That was actually one of the yeah, big I mean, things the, the, that, the, yeah. Go, go on, no, go. No, go, Linton, go. No, you go, Linton. You, you, you well, I was just going to say, it's it's very, very associative, and I like that sense of the book that, that drifts and, and, and that you kind of have to just like, wash over you. But at the same time, it's really carefully constructed in the, like in the first few pages, he makes this sort of point about people talking about comparisons between Stalin and Hitler and who's worse. And, and like the character of Hitler is going to come back up in a, in a story within a story much later. So there is, you know, the book is actually carefully constructed in setting things up, even though these notebooks, and, and, and one important thing about the, the, the book is that the, the fiction is that it's a series of, of, of notebooks that have been found by a lodger years later, right? So the book itself is put together from a series of disjointed notebooks. Um, and so the notebooks themselves aren't always coherent, but the book as a whole is coherent. Uh, that's, yeah, that's an interesting way to talk about it as well there are like to go to that 10 stick with the 10 thing too in this section there are two dates that are specific there's the one that follows where he talks about because the the other part of the site sort of set up the frame of of that he's talking about we're getting a sense of the time and the space and all that kind of stuff but also um he has like these digressions like we mentioned he talks about the mechanism for how he could keep water out of his nose and his in the shower and then there's a wonderful bit in which he talks about the invention of the ballpoint pen, which leads to, like, this possibility for poetry yeah. and this way to write in a totally different way. And then he's got his, like, rants about, like, how, you like, uh, condoms are preventing, like, the nationalism of, of Iceland. And that's really funny. Um, and there's, there are those sorts of bits. And he's really concerned with, like, um, his lodger having sex outside of his door in the light. And that sort of sets a lot of this in motion in these beginning parts because he sees that the light's on in the hallway... And he goes into this bit about, like, well, you know, I had to put into my, my rental agreements that you can't have lights on after a time. He's very concerned about that. Shouldn't include it. And then he dates that part and says, uh, is it January, yeah, January 13th, 1943? And then the last page that we read for today's episode is page 31, where it says, June 24th, 1967, so 24 years later, I must beg forgiveness from my conscience. All night she avenged herself on me with the most terrible dreams. And, like, and so we have two different moments in time of one in which he's being like draconian and like light driven and frugal and part of like his kind of character that you see a bit of in these first two two parts. And then later it's like that seems like a guilt ridden, bad moment, like a, a harrowing, bad, like facing end of your life sort of moment to me. We're just dwelling with the guilt for a bit there, Chad. You, you brought this podcast into a real downer now. I yeah. feel like I'm just going to have to throw the book away. No, you're absolutely right. And I think one of the interesting things about it and sort of setting up the, the next week's podcast as well as that next week's podcast continues in 67 the book's published in 67 so there's a sense in which at times you're getting the end of the book before you get to the end um but at the same time i think what's really exciting about the, the, these opening pages is the way that it's setting up so many of these interesting situations where you've got this guy stuck with these lodgers who he doesn't really want to be with and he kind of reminds us all of that cranky old relative who's like you know reusing every 
every piece of uh, aluminum foil or whatever that they can. Right? <laughs> I mean, this guy will like take the switches out of the the fuse board so people can't use the lights after a certain time. And 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 that's you know both this very particular character who I think is actually one of the great characters in in world literature, but then also this symbol for sort of like what is Iceland, right? And there's all these references to the Marshall Plan and Iceland's role on the world stage. And so I th- we, you know, we're being asked very early on to think about this little house as a very particular little house, but then also, also as the nation, right? So as Iceland within the, within the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, what's weird about it for me reading it is um, it, does it, it does feel very Icelandic and you do feel, I mean, especially that condom part, you're like super aware of his like national identity. Um, but you're also so, he's like so interested in his own thought patterns. And that feels like um, that was actually something that was more salient for me. Um, and kind of the tension between that um, being so stuck in your own mind that that becomes its own little kind of like universe. So you get that a little bit when you, he's talking about his, um, when he's talking about the like rental agreement and the like the like intricacies of like creating this own his own little universe in that apartment. Um, and like that is way more important than any sort of like large national scale. But also that crazy footnote where he's like, that is also like a bonkers <laughs> part where he feels like that that also feels like he's like got his own um kind of uh, universe that is just much more interesting for him or like, I mean, obviously it's like kind of forced on him that it has to be more interesting, but it kind of, it, it feels like more pertinent or more imperative um, to be spending time in this kind of place than in the house or in, in the world at large. Um, that, and that imperativeness when it's like all of this minutia and crazy d- d- is just really like difficult to kind of hold in your brain. It's interesting you mentioned that because that was one of the sections where I just had a question of like, I don't, and page, this is page 25 to 27 that we're talking about. There's a footnote there, but the footnote off of that section, I'm not certain I know what's going on in that section. Like we've had the moment where like his dad has died mm-hmm. and his dad dies and gives him like an insurance, uh, a form of some insurance money or claim to insurance. And he's basically like, peace out to his like sister and mom, which is, a, which is like a section that, that seems a little aggressive and, but also like his sort of independent, I, I'm going to take care of myself sort of thing. And then this party goes back to his mom and sort of seems to be in my mind, remembering like sometime from his childhood when he's like one of a bunch of kids, like there's a ton of, is it 10 kids? He's like nine of 10 kids, whatever it might be. Yep. And then, um, and his mom works at a place that is a, is cleaning fish and then she is something happens and it says where's the line i'm looking for yeah it says um the yellow brush escapes from mom's hands and flies back into the cloudy water she lies in the mud on her back intertwining with the foreman i can see him before me waiting in between the tubs she screams don't let the damn old woman's bloody spittle mingle with the fresh washed fish haul her to the tub's side and goes on, and I was like, I'm not certain if she's having sex with this guy or she's giving birth. And I, and I thought it could be either one, like that, that because it sort of implied that she was pregnant 12 times before, remember that, no profit from laundry, I persist, no harbor, do you want to see me later as Ken, blah, 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 is it maybe she was pregnant at that time? I didn't, I couldn't figure out what, 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 the, what was going on right there. And then in the middle of that, there's this footnote that's totally like describing like the setup of like the fish cleaning operation <laughs> yeah it comes really like intense and mannered and specific and like very weird um so yes i i really honestly that was one of the moments i feel like reading this even the second time was just like i'm not certain i know what that is yeah it's so funny i actually got so distracted by the footnote i actually kind of forgot um, and that, I had that experience a lot um, reading this where like I would get kind of stuck in a hidey hole and forget the context that like I, I had given birth to the situation that I had kind of gotten stuck into. Um, but you're exactly right that. And I think that kind of ambiguity is exactly what makes this like story kind of run is that, no, I have no idea if she she's giving birth or she's having sex. And it, it kind of feels like you're supposed to because of the way time works in this this novel. Um, I kind of feel like you're not supposed to know, but I would be curious what Lytton has to say, because I kind of feel like the ambiguity is what is kind of powering this. Yeah, and I think it's part of the translation challenge is you're trying to create a situation which, um, because I think as a translator, you want things to be clear to a reader, right? And you want to make sure that you sort of sometimes feel, and I started to feel nervous as Chad was saying that, and just like, oh man, have I screwed up here, right? But but then listening to you talk, I feel quite, quite relieved because 
this isn't a book that has clarity to it, right? It has precision, but there is this ambiguity powering it. And so there is this, this sense of this, this writhingness that definitely has to do with, with, with both sex and with, with birth, right? And of course, the two things are, are connected, but with this really weird way in which that's then getting triangulated with, the, with, with a very esoteric and quite specific narrative in the footnote of how you wash fish and prepare fish in traditional sort of Icelandic settings. And, 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 you know, back in a time when you're sort of doing this outside of a, you know, sort of a modern industrial plant. Um, and, and I think the novel's always putting these things together, partly because that's what Thomas's mind is doing. It's really interesting that, like, him thinking about his mom in this situation comes at a moment when she's telling him a story. And you get the sense that part of the way he is is because of the way she has used stories to kind of control or guilt or trip him. That's interesting, too. Well, I like what you're saying. This kind of goes back to Chad's point is that one of the things he was looking for is how does one thought kind of give birth to another or like lead to another thought? I keep using that metaphor. I don't know why. Um, but <laughs> it's interesting that you're that like it is deeply associative or it feels like it's one story coming out of another story or some kind of like like sidebar when it keeps coming up. But there's this funny way um, that like this, like this footnote or the way this story, um, happens feels like a process of like trying to like be more and more specific and in the process of becoming more and more specific, actually introducing more and more like kind of confusion. Um, whereas yeah, some of the yeah. other stories, they don't seem to be kind of like, like if the metaphor was kind of like going deeper into one story to create clarity, some of the other stories are like the, some of the other kind of narrative leaps feel more horizontal. Like, Oh, this thing makes me think about like, you you know, I'm thinking about cheese, which makes me think about mice, which makes me think about like, I need to vacuum right. my floor. <laughs> um, but that's not how yeah. that the rules kind of change when you shift through, shift through the narrative. I, yeah. It, you know, if you're describing that reminds me of that story, the, um, Julio Cortez, has our story that's in Cronopios and Thamas, the name I can't think of, in which she describes how to walk upstairs. And it's basically just like a couple of paragraphs trying to describe like, and then you lift one foot and place it vertical and hor- horizontal to the other one, parallel about a few inches in front, and then with other foot, and it becomes like too complicated to describe, and you're like, oh, you're just walking. But like, to think to break that process down and try and get more and more granular makes it confusing and, and difficult. Um but that's like really, it's a really interesting contrast with like the ballpoint pen section, right? Yeah. Because the ballpoint pen section also feels hyper specific in a certain way, but it's not, it doesn't give me any more clarity about like fountain pens or ballpoint pens or his relationship to pen nibs. It just feels like I'm supposed to somehow like constellate why all of these things are significant for him. And like, you know, the, the his like bodily function related, like the cold saliva thing. Um, and like the, the consistency of his saliva in relation to the pens, yeah. like all of that works so <laughs> differently than like when we're getting this like hyper specific instruction manual on like how to clean fish. And yet they're both like, they're both like this moment of like hyper obsessiveness that just like articulates itself in wildly different ways so that it feels like almost like you should be in two different brains, but you're actually in one brain. That's just looking at the world in totally different ways. That one section, the pen section, I talked about this earlier when we were on um, the uh, radio show. I don't know if I'm referencing that. It doesn't matter to anyone who's listening to this, but was that that section hit me as being like, now that you can have ballpoint pens now because of the pen it, itself, you're able to have poetry. Like before that, you don't, he doesn't really seem connected, but like with this, with his, his ballpoint pen, with the fact that he wrote with this pen, nib, all of a sudden you get this section that's very beautiful. Of like, I clearly remember when the slopes were still on uninhabited land, where houses now stand, and grass and hulse villars, tall, succulent, and green, where Gudrun was, is heading back down, or Jonas, it, were he still alive, that great farmer who stood for innovation and thought about changing the wetness without landscaping and tussocks, an experimental dream of the land. And it starts going and going and becoming more and more like embodied of the land and being able to be descriptive and being able to like kind of make that all work. It feels as if, like, because that comes right after this this pen section, as if that pen is what enables that for him. And, like, that pen's enabling now, in a larger context, like, his mind to be able to write out all these different thoughts. That that that's sort of a trigger for him, of, of a sense, or, like, it, uh, like, it allows him to do this in a way that might not have been there before. Yeah, I th- and I think there's something kind of accidental about all of this, in the... That- um, you know, he sort of finds or stumbles upon these notebooks and so starts writing and he's coming to the end of his life and he feels like he's trapped in this room and therefore writing is the way he 
he, he gets to that. Um, but it's really, I think, important for the book that this modern invention, right, the ballpoint is connected in this narrative he gives of it to, like, outer space, right, and, and to, to um, doing sort of things that are impossible. But, what he, you know, when he's talking about Jonas in, on page um, 25 and that, 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 that lyrical moment, he's talking about the, the farmer poet Jonas Hallgrimsson, who's a really important figure within our Icelandic literature. And you don't need to know that to read the book, but that's another layer where he's actually sort of ironically going back into tradition at the moment that he's thinking forward into sort of space travel. It does, that does connect to Ulysses too, like certain sections in Ulysses where it does just segue back into, um, like the birthing section. Um, I can't think of which, what the name of it is right now, but the one where they're in the hospital and the woman's giving birth and it goes through a sort of like the history of different ways of writing. There's that feeling of like going yeah. in and out into a different, different possibility, different, a different way of describing things. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And he feels like he's kind of, I, I don't know Icelandic literary history, um, but or literary tradition very well, but it does feel very aware of the like romantic to modern modernist turn right here. Um, that kind of, you know, you find yourself, uh, where is it? The word itself evokes the sense of an eternal flow of water from its source, or in this case, the ink that streams into the pen from the cartridge hidden in the depths of the case. You get that kind of metaphor of like the powerful overflow of feeling, um, which is like very words worthy in the way that we think about about how we're going to like channel emotion into or like emotion recollected and tranquility is another way that we talk about poetry mm -hmm. that we like re retreat and we like go out into the world we see like a gorgeous you know cliff mountainside whatever and then we go back into our little holes and we like write about it later and we like create romantic poetry which is very different from the modernist idea which is you know I have an entire world in my brain and I'm gonna like dig it out of there um, so to move that way from that kind of like very romantic and and you know the romantics are kind of considered where poetry as we understand it today kind of begins um that that feels like exactly right what chad is kind of saying that like we would kind of start there and then you know end up in space travel or whatever like of course <laughs> so how much do you know about chamber pots yeah. <laughs> so much about chamber pots <laughs> did, you, did you go and research a lot of this because <laughs> like god damn like not only like i my vision of a chamber pot is not accurate first of all i don't think but like the description of all the, like the like the part on 12 where he's like, I loved my chamber pot. I wrapped my erstwhile acquaintance in the morning news, tied rocks to its ears, and drowned him in the sea by the harbor wall in the early hours of October 30th, 1954. Oh, another date, this reference. Yeah. Um, on the plastic chamber pot, I sewed a patch to its ears to streamline things for my penis. Plastic can be plenty cold to the touch, too, though nowhere near as much as enamel. So the ears <laughs> of the chamber pot, I assume, are like sort of like... I I need to look up. It's like the handles is what I was envisioning, but I need to look up like actual right. chamber pots. I think because I'm not entirely certain I know how you fucking use one. I couldn't tell if it was the handles or like you know when they have like shaped toilet seats. Yeah, and like the front part kind of looks like ears or something. But then I was like, what do you? How does that like, anatomy work? Yeah. Like I can't figure that out. My vision of it got the more I read it, the more my vision became something closer to porn, and like and I was sort of uncomfortable yeah. with where my imagination went. So, yeah. So, what did you? How was that for you? <laughs> Translated. Yeah, it's a great tagline for this book, right? Sort of being uncomfortable with where your imagination is going and sort of things you end up thinking about. And, <laughs> um, and you know, it, it does. It's one of these things where you're translating and you're thinking, you know, like, it's not just about your knowledge of Icelandic or the best words in English, but also, like, your knowledge of chamber pots and other weird stuff that you never think you're going to have to think in depth about. Um, and uh, But again, this is all connected with his, with his family and, like, you know, how, like, family members are sort of throwing the piss out of chamber pots at dogs in the yard and stuff like that. And it's, yeah. <laughs> you know, awesome. it's, it's so weird. <laughs> yeah. It's just wonderful. And it's, it's raw. And it's, it's this meeting of like the Icelandic rural with like, it's not idealized anymore. Right. Like if, if the problem in, in, in literature is sometimes that we, we romanticize the country and, and now the country is transformed into barking dogs and people throwing piss out of the window. <laughs> and, and that seems true at a lot. Very true, and that, that that is that does make it more interesting in a way that life isn't so idealized. Mm -hmm. It has those kind of gritty details, and then you can go in a lot of places with that as he as his mind does. I have a specific translator question for you too. Um, on to go from chamber pots to like language on page nine, towards the bottom, there's a, a the last the last little chunk of that begins with, how is it possible to expect significant artworks will be painted during an age when national industries dominate? or any other important ideas emerge 
when employment, think about that prefix M, is the byline for this age. Initially, I was gullible and empty as a fetus in my mother's belly, or did I suspect how things were embroiled? I have racked my brain on the matter trying to amend the situation without reaching a conclusion. I don't know if there's ever been a safe conclusion found about anything, but I've described the exterior of my apartment, its embellishments, my tiny world that I assembled for myself alone from much beloved parts. So all the M stuff and the prefix M that shows up there, there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven instances of it in that like two, three paragraphs as if he's playing the game with the prefix M. How does that exist in Icelandic? What did you, what were you, were you playing with that intentionally there and what? What is that? Or is it, does it, how does it connect between Icelandic and English as a translator? Yeah, so I think one of the handiest tools the translator has in, in, in his or her toolbox is, is the idea of compensating, particularly over a novel. So you have to accept that as, you, as you're moving things across, you, you're not going to be able to do it exactly because languages are different. But you're trying to get the same effect over the book as a whole. And so the prefix that they're talking about in, in Icelandic is actually A-T, right? And, and the, you know, the word in Icelandic is advinna. So, and, and, and there's a whole series of plays on, on the letter A and T. And actually, Berkson goes really far into it because there's even words there that begin with A and end in T uh, that are all part of that. And so, I, you know, I was like, well, okay, the word fit, that fits best here in terms of sense is employment. So I've got to substitute for AT. I've got to substitute EM. And then there's a couple of other moments where I therefore had to sort of you know, like I embroiled and amend aren't necessarily the closest words in English to the Icelandic, but they needed to be there for, you know, keeping that EM thing going um, and, you know, trying to play around with that. What were some of the other prefixes that you tried out? I'm just curious, like what else you kind of like subbed in there, played around with for a while? Or did you know that you were going to play um, with I mean, EM? I did try. No, I did try and keep the AT for a while, like, you know, and this is the thing about how faithful you can be i was playing around with things like attempted but it, none of it seemed to work with the language of industry and i did try in but that almost seemed a bit too obvious and there's a part of me that hopes that readers won't fully notice how many em words there are yeah. and then until you go back and maybe you listen to the podcast and you go back and suddenly like oh wait actually there's a, there's a ton of the m words and i think that would be you know really nice and the one i was pleased with, with the most of all was embellishments because it seems like a word that fits with the book but it's got em at the start and it's got an M E the other way around in the middle. And I was like, Oh, that's really nice. And I, I can kind of think of, of Bergson himself liking that. Although, you know, things get pretty, you can go too far down this road. Cause then you work out the word apartment has E M backwards in it. And you realize you're just going crazy and, and thinking about chain pots and stuff. <laughs> Which feels appropriate, actually. <laughs> this seems like a section that would, it seems like you're having fun translating that part though. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 a lot of the book, um, I, you know, really had a lot of fun um, with. And even when it gets really dark and there's some really dark scenes and there's some stuff I was translating late at night and just thinking, I do not want to be in this place. And it's dark and it's, you know, at one point it was sort of winter. Um, but the language is so good and the importance of the issues is, 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 is there that it, it just felt like a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. So. Um, I don't know if there's anything else I have to say about this particular section. I think that one, the one other thing that I thought was interesting, and then we can just end this real quick, is that it is a good, good setup for like who Thomas Johnson is. Like you get, you get a sense of his intellectual abilities or prior intellectual abilities or aspirations. That all the references the in the second co composition book or the second book to like on the origin of species, das Kapital, interpretation of dreams. That he used to be a tutor. They ask him to name the dogs. And I think that that's sort of framing like. That he's not just like this old dumb cranky man. Like he's a he's smart. Otherwise, this would this book wouldn't work. Um, but other than that, like I think maybe we like it would be great to end. Like if you guys each have a favorite sentence. Do you have a favorite sentence from this section? I have two. Ooh, Anastasia, good did you want to? Uh... Good question. I have a couple. So hold on. Let me like take one second. I'll, I'll go you for one. Go Anastasia just finding one, which is. You know, considering the diverse scientific discoveries of this nuclear century of which we Icelanders have become conscious, I have most been impressed by the construction of the ballpoint pen. <laughs> I mean, I just love that sentence and where we get from nuclear to ballpoint and the idea that suddenly, like, Icelanders become aware of the nuclear. 
Because I didn't have my first one doesn't have a period. I'm taking two. Um, I could punch the friendliness of those voices right in the mouth is one of my all time favorite lines of <laughs> everything. But then the other one that I thought was great was because uh, <laughs> it sort of like hits at the the kind of sly humor of this book is um, he brought me back into the room where he began playing hide and blind seek and play dancing to quote everyone's a standing statue and other games for the blind. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that we didn't that we didn't mention we, the number of jokes there are about being blind that kind of run throughout here that are maybe a little off color and kind of entertaining. <laughs> it's totally true. Um, I guess the line that I there are like two lines. I love there's like a whole bunch of lines in that crazy fish uh, oh God, footnote yeah. that I really love. But the other one that I really like that we didn't get to talk about is um, about how much he needs to pee when he goes to sleep. <laughs> so I walk around naked at night. No sooner than I get under the comforter, I realize my bladder is filling. Even if it's only a drop of pee, I try to pee. I must empty myself during the night. I lift the lid from the seat and stand with feet astraddle. I hold the chain on the water tank and let a trickling sound trickle suggestively. Two short spurts of the constant urine production. Standing on the cold and damp and chilled floor at night would damage my fragile health. I've always been prone to colds, not only during cold season in mid-January to March, April, but all year round. That one doesn't have a period either. It goes on for a million <laughs> years. But that one's also really, really great. <laughs> yeah, that was the one thing that we didn't, maybe we'll get in this next week, is like the lack of punctuation, which yeah. is which is probably off-putting to some people and is fine, but entertaining. Totally. But anyways, well, thank you so much for joining us. And we will be back next week with, I believe it is just um, the fourth composition book, which goes from pages 32 through 68. Um, and I believe Scott Esposito, barring... Barring any crazy things, Scott Esposito will be joining us to talk about that. He interviewed Lytton for the Quarterly Conversation recently, so it'll be fun and be enjoyable. Uh, until then, you can always pick up the book through our website, um, which is openletterbooks.org. And if you buy Thomas Janssen and put in the code to the number two month, all one word, into the checkout, you'll get 20% off. So get the book, join the Goodreads group, follow the post. Do you have anything you want to plug? <laughs> Of yourself, like your your Twitter, your uh, your other podcasts. Yeah, you can uh, you can hear a little bit more me about me talking about poetry uh, on my poetry podcast, which is called Black Box Poetry. Oh, I thought it was just called Anastasia's Poetry. It is totally yeah, Anastasia's Poetry. Like, That's what Anastasia I'm going to do. Poems. It's my spin. It's my spinoff. Yeah, <laughs> but, you, but repeat it again. So, it's so Black, Box. Black Box Poetry. Uh, you can find us on iTunes on. SoundCloud, on Android, and on Stitcher. Um, We'd love to have you join us. Well done. Okay, till next week.